the plight of men rarely elicits the same sympathy that the plight of women does. While we are quick to call someone out for demeaning women, we are not as quick to step in and defend men. While some say it's about time men take their lumps, our next guest says, not so fast. And so to talk about this, we welcome Catherine Young, Professor Emeritus in the Faculty of Religious Studies at McGill University. She's also the co-author of Replacing Misandry, A Revolutionary History of Men. Hello. Hi. Welcome to the program. <laughs> Boy, you're going to be controversial, aren't you? Oh, it's been controversy for 15 years now, so... Uh, it's writing about this topic, misandry. Just this topic, yes. What makes it controversial? Because women really don't want to hear about men, and men don't want to hear about men, but for very different reasons. Okay, for, we, we'll get into the reasons just okay. a second, but just so everyone knows where we, what we're talking about. Misandry, what is it? It is the teaching of contempt or hatred for men. Simple. Counter, the opposite count, of misogyny. Exactly. Okay, so let's get back to your point, which is women and men both don't like talking about this topic, but for different reasons. So. Why don't women like talking about it? Well, because they've defined men in a certain way and read history in a certain way to improve the lives of women. And uh, they thought that men had always been their centerpiece in history. So why would we want to hear anything more about them? And if we do, maybe they would create some challenges. So why even let that come to the surface? And men don't want to talk about this because? Well, sometimes they have to talk about vulnerability. And part of the male training through so much of history has been stoicism. So to get under that stoicism to talk about problems and weaknesses is a difficult thing to do I'm for guessing, some men. maybe I'm wrong here. Do people label you as an anti-feminist sometimes when you talk about well, this? Well, right yes, of course. Yeah. <laughs> what do you say to that? Well. We say that it's, uh, it's time to understand these problems from a different perspective. And if you want to call names and think that that's going to keep the voices silent, then you can do it. But in point of fact, we really do need to start talking about these issues. Hmm. So it's a label, and it's, a, it's kind of a defensive label now. Any, anyone who critiques anything that's feminist is an anti-feminist. What, um, what originally got you all interested in this topic? Well, we have different reasons. Uh, maybe I m mentioned my co-author first, who's Paul Nathanson. And he was my graduate student years ago at, at McGill, and he was working on a different topic. But we would periodically have uh, discussions of gender, because that, in the early 70s, was beginning to be the topic of the day. And we did begin to think that there was no discussion of men going on at the same time. And perhaps when his thesis got done, we should address that topic. But in the meantime, I've been writing about women and religion, both women and Hinduism, because Hinduism is my field of study, uh, and India. But also, I do quite a bit of comparative work. And we, uh, with one of my Indian colleagues at McGill, we've brought out a number of books on women and world religions. So the first one was 1987, Women and World Religions, and then we wrote uh, Religion and Women and Today's Women and World Religions and Feminism and World Religions and Fundamentalism and Women and World Religions, and on it goes. Uh, but those books, uh, he usually edited them. I don't like the management of those projects. I prefer to do the research and the writing. And we would have a, a woman scholar from each of those major religions, usually doing the, the chapter on them. I sometimes did the ones on Hinduism. But I would get to write the introductions. And I would have to search for the comparative uh, patterns across mm -hmm. all these religions, which in the end really begins to be the patterns across world history in some ways. So that was. That was the start. But how did you to make that leap from, you know, talking about religion and world religions to misandry? Like, what got you interested in that? Well, because as we began to watch the uh, the feminist writings in the 70s into the 80s, we began to see that their portrayal of men was always as inadequate, evil, or what we call honorary women. Now, honorary women is usually a male feminist or a minority male with whom there was a political alliance. 
So we looked at everything feminist coming out, but also in the broader context of women's studies. And because I was doing research in that area, it was what I was reading and everybody else was reading at that time. But uh, we moved from that topic to the first book, which was called Spreading Misandry, The Teaching of Contempt for Men in Popular Culture. And Paul's uh, field in his PhD area was religion and popular culture. So we looked at jokes, we looked at greeting cards, we looked at box office hits, we looked at sitcoms, advertisements, and we saw this image of men, negative images being portrayed as inadequate or Okay, so evil. give me some examples, um, Catherine. When you look around at popular culture or religion, where, where is misandry a, a problem or a challenge societally? Well, before when jokes were made about every group, there, there was no problem because the humor moved around. But now the humor was really be, being directed just at men. So you take Homer Simpson, and he's a buffoon, and his son Brat is not much uh, better, and his wife is the wise one, the wise woman. Okay. Okay, <laughs> so you take Beauty and the Beast, and the, the Beast is totally evil in the Walt Disney presentation. But if you go back to the 1946 version, the Beast was good within. So now the male beast has moved further into the negative stereotype, the negative category. Well, we were just shocked to see how negative the stereotyping had become. Mm. Okay. And shocked, especially when we're beginning to talk about stereotypes. And of course, the very uh, uh, constant criticism of any kind of misandry if there was any stereotyping of women whatsoever. How, how come that was uh, criticized, but not on the side of men? So it's a double standard. It's a double standard. And then that we got really interested in double standards and start to, started to look at them in many, many different okay, contexts. The, the way you look at it is really historically, how we've sort of arrived at today and, and the, the, the take that you have on where we are today societally. The title of your book is Replacing Misandry. Yes. What do you want to replace it with? Well, we want to replace it with a, a, another look at history. The prevailing view is that uh, we've had this history of patriarchy, which has been simply the dominance of men over women, which has gone on either forever, there are several different versions of this, or for so many millennia that it has become embedded in cultures and embedded in people's consciousness. So. Uh, our concern was to go back and look at that history, mm. especially since the book before this one was called The Sanctifying Misandry. And that was a feminist view of history, and again, there are several versions to it, but it really was turning the Bible upside down. So in the beginning was a wonderful goddess and a time of peace and tolerance, and everybody got along together. And then came the big bad men, and they destroyed that wonderful civilization, and now we have everything wrong that could possibly be wrong from uh, nuclear warfare to ecological disaster, you name it. Mm. Okay, let's okay, get, so let, we've done yeah. that part. Yeah. Now, let's take a better look at history. Let's go as historians and test those hypotheses. Okay, let's get into the history then. So you look at ma uh, masculinity starting really in the Neolithic period. That's, yes. Okay. So talk to me how masculinity was defined in that era. We're talking about what years? Well, we're, uh, we're going back to uh, two or three millennia. Okay. So two or three millenn millenniums ago, yeah. how, how are we looking at masculinity? Well, we look at masculinity primarily as men having uh, an importance for the welfare of their societies, their groups, which came from hunting, uh, which came from the it's the very physicality of their bodies, which had good upper body strength and, and mobility. Uh, and this allowed, you know, long distance travel of, uh, to hunt, to bring the animals home. So that was an identity that was based on the body that was 
valued by the society because uh, creating protein uh, was important for, you know, for food, for health, for survival. Arguably, I would say that's still how we look at men today. Well, except we don't want to say there's anything distinctive about men. We always say, oh, well, women can do these things too. So yes, there's some women who have better upper body strength uh, than some men do. But the general pattern has been, you know, greater upper body strength and, and mobility and so forth. Okay, so during this, the other sort of um, attribute we often ascribe to, to men is, is this idea of violence, that they, they, were, they were violent cultures historically. Okay. Is that, how, how, how intrinsic was violence in masculinity during the Neolithic times? Well, let's go to Paleolithic because there, there was very little violence in the Paleolithic time. There was hunting, but we don't have examples of, of warfare. We don't find mass graves. Uh, probably what happened is there was enough land that if there, there did develop conflicts, and conflicts go along with human nature, people could simply take their group and move down the road. And we, you know, the, we know the move out of Africa spread through the entire, uh, uh, entire world, so that no doubt minimized a lot of conflict. And then there were probably uh, cultural values that minimized conflict as well. The, the big conflict uh, context develops with the, with the Neolithic because by the time you domesticate animals and uh, plants, then you have herds and you have storage areas and then you can raid them. So to, to protect your food supply mm. in this new context, you have to have defense. And to have defense when there starts to be constant raids, you have to create a warrior culture. And to create a wa warrior culture then, because no one wants to just go off and get killed, you then have to develop techniques with young boys to teach them how to be martial. Uh, so there are initiation rituals, and initiation rituals that might involve head hunting and scalping and uh, torture of some kind so that you are trained to have the courage, the stamina, the stoicism to be able to go out and do that. You say it, um, they were training young boys, so at already this time we've already established, I guess, segregation of sexes in, in a way. Um, well, in many of the horticultural societies, the the children w lived with the women until the age of puberty. And then with initiation rites, they went to live with the men in a kind of a, a long house or a, a special house. And that was a transition then from childhood and the woman's world to manhood and the man's world and the bonding that then would be necessary, mm. both for hunting on the one hand and for warfare on the other. But is this where you see the first sort of evidence of the segregation of sex? Like where were, if we had to go back historically and sort of pinpoint this is where it started. Um, and I know it's not as easy as that, yeah, but what, what would you point to? Well, the hunting and gathering societies were relatively egalitarian. But one of the things that happens with the Neolithic is we do get sexual segregation and we also can get sexual polarization. Um, both because uh, that there is a need to, to train the young men to be distinct from women, the roles become much more uh, differently defined functionally, and also because some Neolithic societies begin to be uh, matrilocal or matrilineal, and that means if anything goes wrong in the relationship with a woman, the, wo the man has to take up and move on to another village, okay? So sometimes those men get marginalized, not only by warfare, because there's high risk and uh, the threat of death involved, but also they get mar mar marginalized with the matrilocality and matrilineality. Um, and in some of those societies, women become the dominant producers 
of, of crops, such as mm. sweet potatoes, for example. And uh, they are the ones who know how to make them grow. And men often look on them and think, well, women have this natural fertility, and they can make things grow. And uh, <laughs> you know, one group said, well, our, our penises are like uh, sweet potatoes, only they're stunted. And these, these long hairs grow out of them. And we just, ca we just can't make sweet potatoes grow. <laughs> So under, underneath a lot of this warfare and what you think is the dominance of men, there really is qu quite an extreme vulnerability. And that vulnerability can start to act out with sexual separation. And that vulnerability can act out with you know, uh, misogyny and rules to keep women in their places. But it's different from this general thesis that men have all the power mm. or men have testosterone, so they're always going to be violent and put women down. Our argument is when you look at these different revolutions, there are new problems that come into play, and sometimes they affect men in negative ways. And at those moments when they experience extreme vulnerability, they start to act it out against women. Okay. So let's keep moving through history, yeah. so in a general sense. We're a horticultural society, we start urbanized, we start moving into cities. What role did that sort of migration have, what effect did it have on male identity, on, on maleness? Okay, so that's really what we call the agricultural revolution where we get uh, the beginnings of uh, Mesopotamia and Egypt. And we find that men in cities now have new roles. They don't have to just be the warrior or the hunter uh, or the pastoralist, for example. They have new roles, such as scribe, as priest, as a teacher. And these are roles that women can do as well. And the male body is not relevant whatsoever for these roles. So I think the rise of cities is one of the really big dramatic changes in gender history, so to speak. Um, men have a solution to this. And the solution was uh, only men would have access to education and literacy and these new professions. And elite women would be relegated to the home. So that's where a lot of the big time problems started for women. But again, the general thesis is this is just male nature. Men are always bad to women. But here we see a, there's a new problem for men. They've created a solution of controlling culture as their own exclusive sphere. That might have helped solve some of these problems for, for men. But of course, it created a number of problems for women. It seems to me that you're suggesting that, there, that as we move through, through history, that it was almost like a reaction to everything that, that the common problems that we see um, was, was a reactive thing. Like, we will become the scribes and teachers, and therefore women ended up staying home. That, that it, it, it's sort of the antithesis, uh, antithesis of what we tend to believe. Yes. I mean, I, I, there are points where it's also proactive. You know, again, we, we can't flatten everything out. But there are major moments where, where it, where it's a new revolution, it's a, it's a new technology, and humans take a, a while to figure out what the good parts are and what the bad parts are, and how, how do you... And it, where are sports and all this? Because that's another thing we sort of, you know, attach to male identity and have for a long time. Well, we see what happened in ancient uh, Greece as the city men uh, were no longer warriors. They had to move a masculine identity based on be a, being a warrior into being a, city, a citizen and a, and a city person. So they developed civic virtues. Uh, so the good masculinity would be one that was stoic still, but would be benevolent and tolerant and so forth. But they also kept some semblance of importance for the body alive in sports. So they would have almost a cult around sports, as, as you no doubt know. 
and there would be preparations, and there would be music, and massages, and bathing, and, and then there would be events, and the first victory that a young man had in a sports arena would be like an old coming-of-age ritual. Um, then heroes uh, in, the, in the warrior context would uh, gain immortality, okay, and be, offerings would be made to them. Well, so also for the sports hero, mm. uh, they would be, gain mortality in this way and almost be worshipped as gods. Okay, it's, the body's no longer f functional per se, but the sports has, in a certain kind of arena, uh, created a vestigial importance. Mm. Okay, let's skip ahead a few generations, and I and I, I don't want to take away from this. Was, this is a gradual evolution, but, but That's for time right, purposes, we're, yeah, we're skipping ahead. And we're, let's talk about the industrial revolution. What sort of stands out for you in that period that helped redefine the role of man, men, their their maleness and masculinity at large? Well, it's machines replacing bodies. Um, so, the factories, the, the mining. Uh, there's still aspects of that where you need male brawn. And in the early period of, of the Industrial Revolution, there were women and children that were in those factories until laws came along and said, uh, this is not good, and uh, removed them from that context. But that really left the challenge of the machine uh, as the replacement for, for the male body. Oh, yes, there's some lovers here or there. Uh, and the, the elite uh, a aspect of male identity then with this industrialization, of course, would be the managers or the inventors. Uh, and the hierarchy would go from them to those who were pushing the lovers to those now at the very bottom where brawn was the lowest status of all. Hmm. And that was very different from the functional importance it had for survival in the, you know, the, the archaic part of our, our human history. And, um, it, it, you know, we've sort of been talking about it almost like as, as a monolith, um, sort of male culture, which I always sort of, you know, yes. rebuff at in the same way that we talk about um, uh, other things and sort of putting everyone into one, one big group. Are, is there now a distinction emerging between the elite and, and you know, the people pulling the levers? Yes. So once you get uh, the agricultural revolution, much of that was probably built on a surplus, and elites who gained control of that surplus emerged as the as the powerful um, the, the the powerful people in the, in that context. Okay, then we um, we're going to skip ahead again uh, for time purposes only. <laughs> I'm sorry, Catherine. Uh, Great Depression. What stands out for you there? Oh. Aside from being the Great Depression, so men's uh, identity had been, you know, at least based on work in the in the in the factories, and then there were also growing middle class professions, and along came the the Depression, and it was all wiped out, and uh, it was like an illness. Men could hardly walk. They, I mean, like, there were always some men who did well, mind you, but so many men uh, just, you know shuffled along and their, their shoulders stooped down and they, they couldn't contribute anything to their families. And, and the younger men couldn't get married because they didn't have jobs, they couldn't make contributions. So that was one of the extreme crises in masculine identity, one of the extreme points of vulnerability that we can see in human history. Because it challenged all of the, our notions of what it meant to be a man at the time. And, and to be somebody who's... Uh, contributing to society, valued by society, and has a healthy identity. Mm. And when it had shifted to work and there was no work, where was healthy identity going to come from? And where did it come from? It came from a war. So, because men have always had that, you know, that role as warrior, uh, World War I came along and uh, off the men went to war, and for a while, that seemed to prop up male identity, except it was such a horrific war uh, with such en enormous uh, loss of male life that it hardly seemed to be a healthy identity 
in the end, but it did recover one of the, one of the former uh, roles that men had played. So it seems to get out from the depression and uh, give men back an identity, but yeah, just the horrificness mm. of that, that war. At the end of the day, um, Catherine, we'll, and we'll leave our conversation here for, for tonight, are men responsible for their own, I don't know if the word is decline or how we, it, it, through, through history, how they sort of change and shape masculinity? No, I think uh, we, we all reacted uh, to these big human changes in these cultural revolutions. And it sometimes took us a long time to figure out how to cope with them and how to, uh, you know, we got the notion of the omnipotent king, how to move from that to the idea of the just king. Women gained through all of this as well. If they didn't have men who were providing and protecting in those Neolithic societies, those groups wouldn't have survived. Women were often the cheerleaders to get their men to you know, take on these warrior identities. Men generally supported uh, men in war because they needed them as protectors and uh, their lives often got better because of the, the raids, the booty, the, uh, you know, for the victors uh, of, of what would come in. Mm. So yes, feminists don't like that argument. We always like to blame everything on men. If they didn't have their, their male nature, their testosterone, then you know, we wouldn't have any of these problems. But that buys into that other version of history, which I think is one that does not allow us to think that history is extremely complex. And there are many, you know, we can go from very peaceable societies to warlike societies. Much of that depends on the context. And uh, both men and women and children have been involved in it. Mm. Okay, we'll pick up from where we're leaving <laughs> off tonight, tomorrow. We'll talk about uh, the post-war periods and how we sort of have arrived at today where we stand. Thank you for tonight, Catherine. Okay, thank you, Fia. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.